With the release of Eureka Orthos on the horizon, I finally began to make my push to complete Heaven on High solo. And I did it! So here I am to give you my experience and tips. As a result of being a recent lone hero, I'm far from an expert. But more guides are better than less, giving people more options and more points of view. There are some amazing resources from people like Finn and Angelus Demonis to watch and see how they handle things. That's what I use to learn how to solo. But those are less structured, less guide-like. They are mostly POVs with live explanations of their actions. This is extremely good info, but not what a person might first want when looking for how to solo. There's a lot of extra things to take into account when trying to solo a deep dungeon, things that tend to get mentioned less than they should. So here's my go at giving you a guide to follow to become a lone hero. Better late than never? And maybe Eureka Orthos got you wanting a clear yourself. Let's start off with the basics. Heaven on High is the second deep dungeon, unlocked in Isari after the Ruby Sea story quests and having done Palace of the Dead to floor 50. Heaven on High is 100 floors high, getting progressively harder for each set of 10 floors. It has its own unique element that the other two dungeons do not have. Too basic? Well, you'll learn the specifics of Heaven on High from the tutorial of it, and doing the casual floors. I also made a Palace of the Dead guide that should cover everything of the basics. The main thing to worry about is the Magicite from Silver Chests. Those are extremely important for the final floors of soloing, hoarding them as best you can. You can only hold three, so they better be made to count. They clear a floor and give temporary invincibility. For deep runs, you must meet one requirement. Have zero party wipes. If at any point in a save file you fail a duty, the save is dead. Even if you are on floor 100 and run out of time on the way to the reward point, you have to start back at floor 1 or 21. For Lone Hero, you MUST start from floor 1. Floors 1 to 100 all in a single solo save file. No wipes. You can die at least, so long as you have a Palmander of Raising active. Before you even attempt to do a solo run, you may want to do a run to 100 with a few friends to scout things out. But even then, your group will want to prepare for a journey to floor 100. You will want to farm floors 21 to 30 over and over until your Aether Pool gear levels are near capped out. I would say at least 80s before starting a deep run. Because even with maximum gear, things at the top floors are very dangerous. Every clear of floor 30 will grant you plus one to both armor and your weapon, as well as give you an Empyrean Potsherd. These potsherds can be traded to an NPC outside for a bunch of rewards, including 20 Empyrean potions each. You are going to want a large stack of these before you begin. I would say at least 400 for the purposes of having a buffer and leeway to be wasteful. These potions give you a strong regen for their duration, 30 seconds. They have a 15 second cooldown too, so you can have these up 100% of the time. Deep floors while solo, you will never fight a battle without a potion active unless you are a tank. You will also want a stack of food that gives plus 10% vitality for a notable HP buff. In the deepest floors, every extra point matters quite a lot. Also, all those super potions you are picking up, do not throw those away. Those are on their own different timer than the deep dungeon potions. That means you have multiple potions available for healing, the regen ones, and your massive stock of cooldown potions. This guide will be done from a summoner point of view, because summoner is a god tier pick for heaven on high. Level 70 and getting Bahamut turns summoner into the biggest nuke on a 60 second cooldown. Even machinist isn't this good, making it the ideal job to do this on. The other choice would be warrior because, well, warrior. But also inner release at 70, but that's neither here nor there. Summoner has extremely high movement for kiting enemies, running away from them in circles, which massively reduces the damage you take. Pair it with Sprint, and for 10 seconds you could potentially just be immune to damage. You also have a shield on a short 60 second cooldown, and then again, Bahama is just such high damage. A deep dungeon run, not even just solo runs, have a number of extra things you need to deal with that normal content does not have. Kill count? Patrollers, Exploration, Traps, Time, Economy, Treasure Rooms, 
risk versus reward, and floor modifiers. Kill count is simply the number of kills you need to open the way to the next floor. In normal content, you kill everything. Deep dungeons, you are avoiding specific enemies entirely, and only killing the minimum number if possible. Typically, to get to the next floor, you need 6 kills. But sometimes you need even 7 kills, or 8 kills. That's a lot of kills, especially when solo. Using a Palmanda of Flight will typically reduce your kill count requirement in half, rounding up to 4. This also reduces enemy density for the floor. Patrollers are enemies that patrol the floor. They will always keep moving forward until they hit a dead end. When given a split path, it will randomly choose one of the two. In lower floors, you might not even notice that they patrol. In high floors, watching for and keeping track of patrolling enemies is extremely key to success. In the middle of a fight with an enemy with big AoEs, you often need to duck into hallways. But there is now an enemy there, walking into the room you're fighting. You are now in combat with two enemies. That's a bad idea given how hard even one hits for. Some floors, you might get five patrolling enemies, which means either you are dodging like crazy or killing a lot of enemies, which at the least ups your kill count to get out. But some patrolling enemies are an avoid-at-all-cost situation in the final floors. You need to get used to hiding in corners, keeping track mentally of where a patroller might be, and generally constantly checking hallways as you progress. Sometimes a patroller can get stuck in a pair of dead ends for an entire floor's duration, even though there's two other paths it could be taking. Start in room 1, move to room 2, pick room 3, hit a dead end, backtrack to room 1, and back and forth until you eventually get there. This weird and specific situation can put you in huge danger if you aren't expecting it. Even when all patrols are dead, assume you missed one, it might just be stuck at the exit. Exploration is obvious. Dungeons are linear as hell, because people don't like variety. Heaven on High and other deep dungeons, exploration is required. You start in a random room with a random layout, though there are consistent patterns to what a floor's layout can be, with the exit in a random room. You need to find the exit while getting killed without killing a lot of time. Traps are an ever-dangerous thing as you explore. You've probably hit a ton of these in the casual floors. In a deep dungeon run, hitting one of these is practically fatal. Landmine traps can be used to great personal gain if you have a good plan or are a tank. Otter, summoning, pacification, the rest of the traps are just huge penalties. The spawn room will never have a trap, making it super safe to fight enemies in by dragging them back. All other rooms stick to the walls as much as you can. With very little exception, walls are safe to rub your face against. The middle floors, 41 to 79, there is one or two weird trap placements that are next to certain walls. It's this specific room on screen. Try to stick to the flat wall rather than the corner stones. Tip of the stones is where the traps usually are. A room can have up to one trap, but it might have none. Also, hallways never have traps. Those are another safe spot to fight in. Time. Time is your biggest threat in deep dungeons. Well, arguably. But time is always an issue. 60 minutes seems fine. You only need 6 minutes of floor. But a bad floor can take up to 10 minutes. Which means you need to somehow make up some time from another floor. Or you'll fall behind and run out. You also want to reach the boss floors with a bit more than 6 minutes. Especially if you don't have buffs running. It's a doable time, but you want to have some leeway. So more like, you need an average of 5 minutes of floor, and 10 minutes for the boss. Killing enemies takes time. Exploring takes time. And clearing a full run takes a lot of time. An Angelus clear video from 1 to 100 is over 6 hours long. And he's an expert at this. You will likely not be doing a run in a single play session. Nor will you need to, since every 10 floors is still a save point. But look back to even patrollers. Patrollers mean you're not exploring. Not exploring means you're not cutting a path through to other rooms. Not cutting a path means you're not finding the exit. Which is all a complex web of priorities with time. Time remains an enemy to all. Even with the insane firepower of Summoner, time will be an issue. Less so than something like a tank or healer, but still an issue. Economy means resource economy. 
your Palmanders and Magicite. These are your way to fight back against time. Simple strength ups, floor clears, or other effects. If you fall behind in time on a floor or two, you can use a Magicite to instantly skip a floor. You don't want to just be haphazardly using things. Some Palmanders are so strong, using one is absolute worst case scenario. Again, a Magicite is a floor clear. Nothing can survive it except for bosses, unless it is an Odin Magicite. And with how hard floors get, wasting a resource on an easy win is a huge loss. Not only was it a safe win, but now you are down a resource. A resource that might be super useful later. Like, say, for Floor 99, which guaranteed has three negative floor effects every run. You have to budget, essentially. Try and use your time wisely, then use Paw Madness to gain back time as you go. Make sure to open coffers as you pass them for hopefully gaining more resources. This is something you will see is what led to my victory. Beyond even just using wisely, though, you need to use the timer wisely, too. Let's say you have a strength running at the start of floor 95. There is 30 seconds left on it. You have a room with a hard-to-kill enemy in it, but is a decent pick for getting a kill count to open the exit. It is also blocking the door. There is also a very easy-to-kill enemy. Rather than killing the easy enemy, kill the hard one first. Not only does this make moving into that door safer, but gets you kill count, and makes maximum use of that 30 seconds of strength. Or perhaps you were deep into a floor. You just cleared the exit room but didn't open the way forward. The chest has a palmander of strength, but you're full on them. Do you use it now? No. You will go find your next target, then use it. But maybe your next target is an easy one. Kill the target, open the exit, return to the chest, and then use the strength. Then the next floor, one that may be worse than your current floor, has an advantage running. Small optimizations like this can be huge in deep dungeons. Treasure rooms are special rooms that you might also have heard called monster houses or monster closets. They are rooms filled with like 20 enemies at once, packed in so tight that there's no space between them. They also always contain a bunch of chests to plunder in return. But this isn't exactly a fair trade unless you're willing to dip into your economy and the next topic, Risk versus Reward. A treasure room can be tempting, but that means killing enemies. Killing enemies takes time. It might also be in the way of the exit, meaning you have to fight through it to get to the exit. But to fight through after the exit opens means you're wasting precious time. Or you have to use a petrification, one of your strongest palmanders, to kill it all. Or you can use a concealment, stealth through the room and avoid anything that isn't a safe bet. Sometimes the treasure room is even the exit, so you have no choice but to use something. There really is just no time to clear it out in the deepest floors. But I mentioned skipping things that aren't a safe bet. This leads right into risk versus reward. This is one of the biggest factors for winning a run, mostly when done poorly. One of the unique aspects of deep dungeons is the chests that appear. Bronze chests will have potions, phoenix downs, and a chance for a potsherd. This chance increases the deeper you go. Silvers upgrade your gear, can have Magicite, those super good nukes, and can explode, doing 80% of your max HP and damage. If you aren't max HP, don't open a silver. And then golds have Palmanders in them. In the first 30 or so floors, bronze chests have a chance to become Mimics instead. The next set, silvers can become Mimics instead. Then finally, gold chests can become Mimics in the last 40 floors, while bronze and silvers are safe. Magicite is a super low chance to obtain, especially in the higher floors, and you can only hold three, which means you will be relying on your much larger pool of Palmanders usually. But then that means you are either permanently down a resource, or have to risk spawning a Mimic with every gold chest check. Every chest can be a Mimic. A gold chest dropped from a Mimic can also be a Mimic. And Mimics can cast Pox on you. A long 10 minute debuff that reduces your damage, turns off auto regen of HP even outside of combat, and applies a nasty damage over time effect. This is so bad that there's a Paw Mandate just for clearing Pox. On top of all of this, Mimics are often one of the strongest enemies on any set of floors. They can kill you and have high HP. 
So unless you are a job with an interrupt, you are guaranteed to get pox in the final floors. Or spend another resource like a witching to cancel the malice cast. Risk versus reward. You risk losing more for gaining some random pomander. You might not even get something good. Capped out on three raisings and already have one used? Well, that risk was completely worthless unless you coincidentally die on the same floor. And this goes back to time and treasure rooms. If the exit is open and you go for an extra chest, you might lose time for that extra mimic kill. When going through a treasure room while under concealment, a mimic will break the concealment. So will a silver chest that explodes. Concealment and going for the chests in a room full of enemies, huge risk without plans to also just magicite or petrify when the mimic appears. If you got spare purity pomanders to remove pox, an early floor mimic can just add to your kill count at a purity cost. Or you can eat that time lost from the pox and just deal with it. Finally, there are floor modifiers. There's a large list of them, including positive ones like haste and sprint. But mostly, we need to worry about the bad ones, which is more risk and reward. Max HP down is a minor one. There's gloom, which ups enemy attack and defense. But most worrying of all, we have no items. No items locks both your pomanders and your potions. That shuts down all of your options for the floor, except for Magicite. And in deep floors, you want a potion running for basically every enemy. A no items modifier is essentially a forced serenity usage. They clean up the effects a floor has on it and are usable even under a no items effect. It's that or a Magicite usage, which is arguably even worse. Either way, you're going to be taxed. You need to make sure you are saving your Serenity Palmanders for only the floors that matter, that force you to use one. Floor has Gloom? Well, you're fighting through it. Too bad. Floor has no abilities? Huge time loss. Pick your targets right, and nothing that can enrage. Floor 85 and it's a no items floor? That's a tax. Or become a god tier player that doesn't need potions. And I'm pretty sure that's not an option. These are things you need to account for, plan for, and execute on for maximizing your chances of success. The less you try to account for the content being different, the less you will succeed. Even some insane luck can be squandered if you do not take advantage. Which leads us into actually doing a run. And I'll sum up the first 70 floors as this. If you care about the first 70 floors, you probably are not ready to clear. If you insist on seeing a bit of what I do not cover in this video, I will have a video of all the bosses and my full run from floor 51 onward. That is in the description and should be a card in the corner. I didn't even need that many runs to clear, and by the time I did clear, I already thought the first 70 floors were completely free. They might take time, still need you to actually fight stuff for a bit, not be reckless, but those are the basics. You don't want to be running through the middle of a room lest you run into a trap. Sticking to walls minimizes trap activations, with one or two spots still possible to trip you up. You don't want to be multi-pulling. Summoner is squishy, but can easily survive most enemies just by kiting a bit in a cleared out room. The regen pods will be more than enough even for the scary enemies. The only enemy that you will specifically want to care about up to floor 70 is the Onrios in 61 to 70. They can do a nasty dot and some nasty damage and are also proximity based aggro. Everything else, basic kiting and potions running is more than enough to survive. At most you will want to know that the Wakakusa Morble seedlings are sound based aggro. RP walk to skip them if you want. That isn't to say they are literally free wins. Mentally and experience wise, by the time of my clear, they were. Enemies have AoEs that will one-shot you if you don't dodge, but the vast majority are slow casting. Just don't try to be 20 miles away at max casting range when there's enemies that can do donut-shaped AoEs, like the plant ladies of 61 to 70. Again, the difference is feel versus reality. You can still very much die to anything. You still need to use your potions and play carefully. But if you do that, Onrios are essentially the only major threat of these floors. That and Mimics. It isn't a free win, but with even a little bit of experience, you'll feel like it is. Summoner is just that strong. 
treat the first 70 like 71 plus and you are pretty golden. The exception is exploring. Full clear every floor of chests on your way up to 70 where you can. You want to max out the palm and stash before we hit the difficult floors. On my winning run, I did this and still only found like two raising palm anders in the entire thing. I went into floor 71 with two raising palm anders and got no more afterwards. So while things are easy, loot the place. Otherwise, the only things I'll go over for the first 70 floors are the bosses, just to show you how to deal with them. Floor 10. It's literally just the Siren Song Sea boss. Avoid the targeted AoE. Run behind it after it does the knockback. That's it. You don't even need potions. Floor 20. Very little to this. Does a conal AoE in your direction. Will summon small butterflies that dot the outside edge of the arena while it casts a gaze. Stand middle. Dodge the occasional AoE, and avoid the gaze by looking away. Floor 30. To even get to this point, you probably fought this thing 30 times or more. Stand far away when it casts the proximity-based AoE, and stand under one of the clouds. Being knocked up removes a cloud, where otherwise everywhere would be hit by one. Dodge the AoEs that come. Supercell is the scariest one, since it covers the entire arena in front of the boss. So don't be overly far away. Likely still don't need a potion. Floor 40, basically free, will do a targeted AoE, line AoEs, and a knockback like floor 20. Get knocked back to one of the sides where there is no wind currents on the edge. These safe spots are perpendicular to the wind currents. You may need a potion or two if you don't also try some kiting. Floor 50, basically just the sunken city of Scala boss, has a gaze attack, frontal cone, and line AoEs based on the pose it makes, with no cast bars. Seems to always go, conal, line, gaze, and then the only real dangerous part. It will do a proximity AoE with a bunch of orbs dotting the arena randomly. These explode a few times before they vanish, into the next conal AoE. Stand far and away from the orbs. Circle strafe around the boss or arena and you are safe. May need potions. A special note here, starting from floor 51, I would recommend having plus 10% vitality food running at all times. 10% extra vitality is worth a ton, whether you realize it or not. Floor 60, boss is finally starting to hit hard. Boss herself does very basic AoEs, targeted circle, frontal cleaves, and boss centered circle. The real danger is the spawning staves. Staves will always do the same things. First, they will do a thin donut AoE around themselves, then a line AoE in your direction. The first set of staves will appear into groups of three and four, randomly placed around the edge of the arena, and then four toward the middle. Three spawn, four spawn, three do donuts, four do donuts, three line AoEs at you, four line AoEs at you. So go around the edge of the arena where one of the first staves is not, and you are safe. The second set of staves will cover nearly the entire outer arena. Don't rush, but start heading toward the middle as you bait a targeted AoE, or head to one of the small safe spots that are behind the staves, toward the edges, but inside the donut. I prefer the large middle zone since it is always safe. Then head back toward the edge, slightly outside of the staves and between two of them. From here, all the line AoEs will converge in a very small square that is easy to dodge. Staying in the middle, it's less clean. Oh, and the boss is doing an AoE here, I guess? It doesn't hurt really at all, as long as you keep potions running. Starting from floor 61, golden chests can be mimics. Grab every silver chest you can find for the chance to get a Magicite floor clear. Even if you are at 3, passing up on a silver is passing up on the chance to freely skip a floor. Floor 70, a boss with a real mechanic here but otherwise is entirely rendered non-threatening by basic circle strafing around the edge. Predator Claws is a basic frontal AoE. You've dealt with this before. Slabber is a large AoE on your location. Inner Space is a small bit of damage that makes a small puddle into Ululation raid-wide damage. Do not stand in where the puddle appears and ignore the targeted icon over you. That only applies in a party, as this is indicating who gets targeted by Hound out of Hell. This will stun you on hit, and instantly kill you with the Devour follow-up. Stand inside the puddle to turn mini and avoid the Devour. 
You can use self-shields like Radiant Aegis to entirely negate the damage of Hound out of Hell, and also the stun. Be careful of this if you do it. You must wait for the Devourer before you leave the puddle. The stun would normally last until after Devourer, so may even be a safety measure to intentionally be stunned while in the puddle. Once Devourer goes off, walk out of the puddle for Ululation again. The rotation then repeats until it dies. Keep your potions running when you're taking damage and you will survive handily. From here, a solo run finally begins. I say again, 1 to 70 will become routine and easy if you need more than even just one run to clear. Any mistake you make in 1 to 70 would be twice as lethal, if not more so, from 71 and beyond. From here, you will want a potion running for almost any and every enemy you fight. Maybe after taking a hit or two, but it does have the real chance of killing you by itself. This is also where the biggest rewards are. The Platinum Sacks from Accursed Horde Findings have the rarest loot, but we don't want to go deep exploring when an Intuition procs. If we pass by where an Intuition shows you a Horde location, grab it. But the time loss from exploring just for the Horde? Not worth it since we're aiming for a solo clear. Try not to ever use an Intuition on the 7th floor or higher, as there is a good chance you just waste the Palmander. The following info also becomes very relevant. What is Sight? sound, and proximity aggro. Some enemies you can just run behind without them knowing. Others you can turn on RP walk and just pass right by them from any direction. Others, if you are anywhere near them at any point, they will aggro to you. Assume a mob is site-based unless otherwise noted. You may have also noticed that mobs tend to be grouped by floors. At the very least, mentally assume two groupings. Set one on the first half of the floors, set two on the back half but some enemies appear more in the middle of these two sets. The first half of 71 to 80 is relatively safe. A number of very easy pickoffs with some dangerous mobs here or there. Patrolling Tigers are pretty dangerous and their damage is high. They do a huge frontal cone AoE that is slow to cast and easy enough to avoid just by kiting in circles. Eye shine is a gaze, just don't look at them during. The Frozen Golem patrolling mobs have basic AoEs that you'll avoid just by basic kiting. Easy kills. The final patrol mob is the Lions. They are similar to the Tigers and another mob you will target a lot, Wraiths. They do very high damage like the Tigers and have a large AoE around itself that necessitates you have a good amount of room to dodge, like a hallway available. Wraiths are proximity aggro and like to attack with large AoEs outside of combat, but have a seemingly pretty small range of influence. Be careful when approaching any new room for these to just cast AoEs as you approach. In combat, they have a massive AoE of Scream. Make sure you have a hallway or other escape route as you begin the fight, as it is a huge AoE. It will follow up with the same AoE as out of combat. A good kill choice. The deer, I believe, cannot do anything but auto attack in a solo run. Very easy kill choice. Bombs are also a good kill choice. All they do is a small explosion around themselves every now and then. Kite them and they can't get near you at all. The Elbst, fishy enemy, can do cleaves and targeted AoEs. These are kind of dangerous outside of combat, as they have a good distance that they can just decide to shoot a targeted AoE at you. Be sure to watch under your feet at all times with these around, and are a good target for killing. Mammoths like to spam prehistoric trumpet outside of combat. It doesn't hurt overly much, but it is damage better avoided. In combat, it does a frontal cone AoE into a second conal AoE with a much wider range. Get to the sides and more behind a mammoth when it uses woolly inspiration. Good to kill just due to the trumpet. Yetis are pretty safe to kill. They do a giant conal AoE, but as long as you kite near the enemy, you can quick get out of it. The main issue is Northerlies. If you let it live long enough, it will cast the skill and kill anyone hit. Line of sight it with a wall to survive. Yaks are very non-threatening on the surface. They only auto-attack and not even that hard. However, they have a 30 second or so in rage. They will draw in everyone nearby and do a stomp, killing you. Focus it down and you should be fine. Here you see me barely avoid the enrage because I did not have any burst and the floor was under gloom. Okami, avoid at all costs. These guys hurt harder than anything on these floors. They also have a drain. The only times I have fought these, I felt like I was in a losing battle, even when I won. B 
Be sure you have a steel or strength running, and your Bahamut ready if you decide to fight one. Puddings. Avoid as well unless you are good at using line of sight. Ducking in and out of corners can cancel the spammed casts. These hurt and get even more painful shortly into the fight when it will buff itself. Similar to Okami, kill it fast if you fight it at all. Here we can see in my winning run, I actually made the mistake of fighting one. It didn't end well because I am not good at line of sight. Griffins are proximity aggro. If you get anywhere near one, they will attack. But you also absolutely want to avoid them if you can. These hit harder than anything else on this floor set and have an enrage. On pull, they will cast Free Fall, targeting your position with an AoE. A bit later, it will cast a second time. This about marks the 30 second enrage. Words of Winter will cast, killing anyone within line of sight, so hide behind a wall when it starts to cast. This also buffs the griffin even if you survive. If you must fight a griffin, go all in on destroying it. As you can see, a number of these enemies become very deadly. Even considering fighting them, you probably want to have a burst phase ready. Abuse line of sight, and kite because your life depends on it. Maximize your Bahamut uses as best you can to take out the biggest threats first. I'll reiterate. On these floors and beyond, you need to prioritize cutting a path straight to the exit. Minimal exploring. Open chests as you pass them and find the exit as soon as possible. Ideally before you start these floors, and when you finish them, you will be maxed out on Palmanders. You do not want to be missing anything for 81+. Plus. 71 was notable enough to finally be worth talking about in depth. 81 and beyond is a step harder than even that. Here's some highlights that show my process for doing these floors. I immediately serenity floor 73 due to getting an extra. I got very lucky here since it was an awful floor modifier. No abilities and gloom? My DPS was basically zero. I have to serenity floor 75. Was very bad luck there. But what can you do? Get yet another serenity is what? That. That is pure luck. A common theme for this set of floors is hunting down patrolling enemies instead of leaving them go. If an enemy is killable, I like taking it out of the equation where possible. Just remember this can take time you do not have. Floor 77, I make a stupid move and use an AoE. This gets two griffins into a fight and forces me to witching, or die. Be very careful of your AoE moves as a summoner. Pull a single target and let things get close before you AoE, which is Eggies and Ruin 4. Getting out of 78 was a huge risk. Two enemies right next to the exit, one being a deadly griffin and the other an even deadlier, for me at least, pudding. But if you watch the timings and positionings of enemies, sneaking through most rooms is very doable. Run almost ended on 79 since I forgot Yaks have an enrage. And this floor had gloom, making it take far less damage. On a normal floor, I would have been fine. Here it was a huge risk. Also, here on 79, I realized these hallways with railings, the rails count as walls. So if you line of sight behind it after pulling an enemy, they will be forced to run toward you. This makes griffin hunting way safer since they seemingly can't auto attack until after the free fall. Boss fight on floor 80 is a Fenrir. It is recommended to have steel running for this boss fight, but it is doable without one with smart play. A little bit of luck, and never forgetting your potions. As long as you kite around the arena, the main threat is Ecliptic Bite. He will do an auto attack's worth of damage or more every now and then. But again, good kiting and usage of your shields and extra potions should keep you alive. With a steal, you're super safe. The main mechanic is when he summons a bunch of ice orbs randomly around the arena. An icicle will also land in an AoE. This icicle would do an AoE line across the arena, breaking any ice orbs it passes through. These explosions will cascade. If an explosion hits another ice orb nearby, that orb will explode too. Watch for where the icicle will go across the edge of the arena and position yourself well away from any ice orbs. They don't have an overly large explosion, but there is no proper AoE indicator to see their true size. If an orb is nowhere near where the icicle will cause cascading explosions, you are safe to stand near it for a moment. Any orbs that survive the icicle's path will be exploded by Luna Cry from the boss. It does light damage, but the fact it explodes any remaining crystals, you need to ensure you are away from the remaining ones. From there, it just repeats. Keep your HP topped off, 
Pop shields and potions as needed, and don't be tempted to physic. I would be genuinely impressed if physic was enough to save you from anything. This isn't a matter of, but your DPS loss. This is a matter of physic is just trash. Red Mage would happily be spamming Vakir on itself to survive. Floors 81 to 90 are where things get a lot worse. Everything here hurts. Everything here is a threat, and the most dangerous enemies you need to avoid are patrolling mobs. We will likely start sticking our hand into the palm and pile as well. If we fall too far behind due to a bad floor or two, we want to pop a strength. Or maybe even a petrify if it was that bad a run. If you need to make up time, you make up time. Garula is a scary patrol, but good to take out. They will immediately dash to you and hit you hard when aggroed. From there, they can do a large conal attack and large AoE around itself, requiring you to have a lot of room to fight it. It will then enrage and spam Earthquake for decent damage. You can hide behind a wall to block Earthquake, though. It does stop after about 10 Earthquake pounds. Very important is how you handle the initial dash attack. You can get the Garula caught on a wall after it starts to dash. This is ideal, as it can immediately auto-attack you when the dash ends. Caught on a wall, you're on the other side of it, and enemies can't auto-attack through walls. Safely taking down these enemies heavily relies on this, but you can survive if you mess it up. Manticores are a bit less scary than Garulas, personally. They too do the initial dash, and then shortly after will buff itself with an attack up. Make sure to kite them well for the duration, as their damage is pretty high. It only lasts for 30 seconds, and there are targeted fireball and ripper claw casts in the middle of it, giving you some breathing room. Just make sure to get behind it, or kite far for the claw. Ideally kiting, since you don't want to be close for the autos. When the buff runs out, it gets a damage debuff. This makes the manticores completely safe to fight. Just keep dodging Ripper Claw and your potion running. Shinzei I avoided at all costs. These patrol and also do extremely heavy damage. With steel and ideally also strength, you can probably safely fight it. I just tried not to ever. They have a dot they apply, and an unavoidable AoE that hits four times and also places another dot. Very scary. Ryujin and Anko, the demonic and fish humanoid looking monsters, they are essentially the same thing. Both hit pretty hard with an occasional buster in their auto attacks. If you suddenly get hit by straight punch, that was the buster. They can also do self-targeted AoEs like Plane Pound and Elbow Drop. Elbow Drop will only be used when someone is behind them. It has a cast bar that you can bait, and would be very worth it due to that locking them out of auto attacks. I've never been able to get it to work even after a Plane Pound cast, so it's more dangerous than it's worth. Remember this for Eureka Orthos. Matanga are very much similar to the Garula again. We'll jump on you for a dash attack that hurts. Get it caught on a wall and then start kiting while your potion does its work. It then spams telegraph that are very much not scary when you are kiting. If you stop for a cast, they might get you inside of one, but there's time to move out when it appears. Gorillas are scary both outside and inside combat. Outside of combat, they can eat bananas and spam AoEs that give physical vulnerability stacks. Line of sight or avoid outright until they stop. They also get a damage up from this banana. In combat, they auto hard and bust it hard. Browbeat is on a short cooldown and hits very hard. 6k damage and it can crit even harder than that. Be ready to put all your resources into these when you can. Minotaur, called Gozu, are the same as any normal Minotaur. Giant frontal cones with the swipe attack, but instead of swing, it has hex. This is a gaze. Just look away when the cast is going off. Kite it even a little, and the only danger is the kiting itself. Just don't go too far as to be unable to dodge the swipes. Elephants outside of combat can use Rock of Ages at your position. It has a pretty decent radius of casting and is a decently sized AoE, so be careful when approaching any new room. They can also do it in combat, so keep moving. They hit pretty hard, but as long as you kite, the constant rock spam should make this an easy kill for your count. Chimera are ironically one of the easiest enemies to fight, and you probably will due to their proximity aggro. They cast lock themselves a lot. If you've learned how to fight one Chimera, you've fought them all. The only real gotcha is the breath attacks. Somehow I didn't get Chimeras in my winning run, like, at all? I think there was one on the floor I petrify, and then no more. Cyclops are pretty safe wins with more measured kiting. They will alternate glower and swing casts pretty often. 
Glower is a frontal line AoE, and Swing is a large AoE around itself. Just like a normal Cyclops. Again, pretty free win? Fight these where you can. Koki actually can auto pretty hard and get more dangerous as the fight goes on. They also have Proximity Aggro. The rotation is to start with a very big Donut AoE, so stay close. Then is a very thin, but very big Cone AoE towards you. So kite, but not too far away. Finally is a Blood Moon cast, putting a vulnerability stack on you. You can light of sight it if you have very good timing, but it's hard. Generally, I see Koki suggested for main targets for kill count, and I can't disagree either. The floors they appear on get rid of most of the other easy targets. Gubus are slightly safe, but you need to be relatively quick on the kill. The rotation goes dot targeted AoE, dot suck you into melee range, frontal cone AoE. To dodge this frontal cone, run behind the Gubu the moment you get sucked in. These are pretty easy to kite but the dot stacks more and more as the fight goes on. So the longer the fight goes, the less safe it is to fight. If you can kill fast, this is a very safe fight. For some highlights of my winning run, we have some good stuff. Floor 81, I immediately find a Magisite, but I do not use it. I instead go through the floor and sneak past everything to look at chests. This is dangerous if I sneak through a crowded room, but due to the invincibility granted by the Magisite, it is doable and then I open a Mimic anyway. This is why I waited to see if I could find a few goodies first. If I open a Mimic by luck of the draw, I can just kill it with the Magisite usage and be done. I also take the extra time to go grab the bronze chest for pot shard drops. Floor 82, we open with a Matanga line of sight or two. As mentioned with the enemy overviews, we want to line of sight to prevent what happens with the third one that nearly kills me. The dash hurts and can crit. Crit into an auto that can also crit is extremely bad. If you can time the line of sight, do it. I also panic witching a gorilla. I did not have the confidence I could kill it, so I wanted to preserve my raising. Floor 83, another serenity usage. It was that or forced into petrification or something. I'm trying to save all my floor clears for 91+. Plus. I also spend a lot of time on this floor, waiting for my burst phase to come back up for the Matanga. I really do fear these guys but at least my reward is a serenity in the exit room. Floor 84, we have the Shinzeis that I never fought because everything says to avoid them at all costs. And with how much everything else hurts in here, I believe it. After immediately opening a Mimic, I decide to just petrify to save myself the pain of pox. And then I get a second Mimic anyway. I take the time loss and hope to just make up for it in later floors. Floor 85 is another floor I just say screw it to. Honestly, I do not know why I did it. I think the stress was getting to me, because the Shinzei's wandering around and my pox, I was not in a good position. Luckily, Floor 86 immediately pays me back with a Magisite in the first silver I find. 86 is also where Manticores start showing up for me. Do not take these guys lightly. This one nearly kills me. I open Floor 87 with an alteration, hoping for some Mandragora next floor. Again, not sure why I did this, Maybe the blindness made me panic. Alteration are a very good way of making up time when you're behind if you get a Mandragora room, but I have very bad luck. Risking mimics is often a bad call for me. I also end the floor needing one last kill and realizing all that are left are Enkos, so I pop a strength. If I did not have blindness, I would have just skipped it, but I did not feel I could kill the Enko without it. It would kill me instead. Luckily, I got good hits in and might not have needed it, at least I go into 88 with strength. Floor 88, I got Corrigans. Only two, but I suppose it adds to kill count. I am also able to fly 89. Yes, I'm still taking risks even with the timer getting low. A 9 minute pox penalty would have definitely needed a purity. Floor 89, I make a super stupid mistake. Definitely nerves getting to me. I did not check for patrolling enemies. Always check for patrolling enemies before starting a fight, or you're going to regret it. And because of my luck and what risks I took, that was my last raising. From 71 on, I did not find any raising pomanders, which means I go into the boss dry, and the final floor is dry. The boss on floor 90 is the absolute most threatening of them all. A steal is definitely recommended, but it's just barely doable without. Just use it if you got one, and start the fight by putting down these markers. One mark just barely below direct east, 
one just barely below northeast, and one on the right side of the exit door. Start the fight and push Onra toward 86%. Dodge the AoEs as he uses them. He cycles between targeted AoE, a line AoE, and a self-centered AoE. As he gets close to 86%, go park him next to A. Have him pointing slightly southward of the marker. You will know his face has changed when he begins to cast Ancient Quagga. Quagga hurts a lot, so make sure you have healing pots rolling, on top of his autos hitting like trucks. Anyway, from here, as he is casting Quagga, move to the north end of the marker. He will turn to look at you, do an auto attack, and then you want to run. The moment he punches you, run to your second marker while hugging the wall. This will get you to the marker safely while avoiding the earth orbs that will begin to explode. Stay here at the mark until he casts his line AoE at you. First will be a meteor being summoned at his position. This will be of no real danger with potions running. He will then move to you and use the AoE. This is when you will move to the third marker. Here he will use the targeted AoE at you, to which you will backtrack toward the second marker, and remain at the edge of the AoE. The meteor will land and do a bit of damage. The targeted AoE will be dodged, and the mechanic will end. He will then use the self-targeted AoE before resetting back to Ancient Quagga. Head back to the first marker and repeat until he dies. Actually pretty safe when you have the markers, even if nerve-wracking. The final floor set is the final push. You want to use all of your resources for this floor set. Well, as much as is needed. If you have resources, use them for getting through. There's nothing more to save them for aside from stuff within this floor set, but there's a priority you want to follow that may differ based on your comfort. You want to nuke as many floors as you can with Magicite and Petrifies, but the floors you do them on should be planned or as a counter. If a floor has no negative modifiers, you want to hold your nukes. If your floor has decent negative modifiers, hold your nuke. If a floor has awful modifiers, Serenity or nuke. But you want to save a Serenity or a Magicite for floor 99. This always has three negative effects, so you need some kind of counter. If you get yourself into an unwinnable situation like two enemies at once and you don't have a raising, that's a panic nuke. Or maybe it's like the run I had, where there was no real way to get kill count safely, even on a floor with no effects. Nuke it. Your goal is to get to 91 with 3 Magicite and 3 Petrifies if you can. That makes 6 floors entirely free wins. With 3 floors you have to manually fight through. But if you get lucky, you can end up having Flight or Alteration give you free wins on those floors too. But even then, you have to fight through those floors. The less resources you are able to bring, the worse this set of floors will be. But personally, this floor set gets easier the deeper you get. It is always dangerous, always possible to die at any moment, but the back half is safer to deal with due to what enemies there are. Which, let's talk about those. Gozu here are patrols and are mostly avoid at all costs without having a full burst. With buffs up, you can take them on. Without them, or at minimum your full opener, just avoid. They do the dash attack that Gorillas would do, has a double auto like the Gorillas, and then can do normal Minotaur stuff. Both swipe and swing. That's Konal and then AoE around itself respectively. Dullahans are called Kubinashi. They are also patrols. Avoid these at all costs as well, and I did not fight any again. They have a life steal, double attack, and buffs itself every so often. This is a permanent effect that leads to an enrage at three stacks. Do not fight at all costs. Night Pegasus, the Tenma, are actually decently safe fights for being patrols. They have a line AoE, burning bright, with no telegraph, and then a huge AoE around itself. Keep your distance and be ready to dodge to the side. Otherwise, kinda free. Dodo is the final patrol mob. This guy only appears on floor 99 and is not guaranteed. Again, do not fight it. Basically has like five different mechanics. 
can sleep you, buff itself, double attacks. Just do not touch. The first set of floors will have three types of enemy called Nupepo. I hope I said that right. You have to look at their attire to know which it is. There is a white mage, monk, and warrior. White mage is very scary and very much wants you to line of sight. All they do is cast stone. If you are bad at line of sight like me, these are a big risk. If you get lucky or good at line of sight, they're basically entirely free kills. Monks are the safest enemies on the first floors to fight. This contradicts everything else I've seen, but here's how to beat these. Kite, congrats you win. Their main danger is that shortly into the fight, they will buff themselves with haste and evasion. Evasion causes attacks to miss, but only lasts 4 seconds. Pull and kite, then when he starts casting, move to far away, then start kiting again when the casts end. As long as you are kiting, you can easily kill them off. One guide also says sleep is an option, but it is not. Warrior is a do not interact. They hit hard, have a double auto with Butcher's Block which hits even harder, and then have a triple knockback that hurts. Just do not. And if you have to, just witching it. Like, look how close I came to dying. Jackie are decently safe to fight. They have a cast in addition to their autos, so kiting is very much appreciated as always. After a bit into the fight, position yourself so that you have a line of sight available. Charybdis will be cast. If it hits, it will drop you to 1% HP. Long as you take this attack into account with your kiting, it's a good target. But if you get the large open rooms... Jinba can buff themselves and auto hard, but if you kite well, they are much more manageable. What you need to look out for is when they cast Elegant Fear. This is a gaze. Tuck yourself into the corner of the room next to a door as this casts. Not for the gaze, but for the meteor that comes after. This is placed on your location and can be line of sighted. So place the meteor, then run into the hallway and you are safe. And you can finish killing it while in the hall. Shabti are one of the absolute easiest enemies to kill. If you kite them basically at all, the only thing they can do is spam Death's Door. It is a very fast cast, but very thin line. Strafe dodge basically at all, and it is the closest thing to a free kill as you can get. Mifune are the only proximity aggro in the floor set. Treat these similar to Jinba. Kite well and be ready for their cast. This you must line of sight or instantly die. They also hit pretty hard. Kyozo are a safe target, but be sure you're constantly on the move. They can cast Gust outside of combat and will actually hunt you down from other rooms to come and throw a Gust at you if you're in range. Always watch your feet as the cast isn't too slow. Otherwise, their other cast is a self buff. It ups their defense and actually can remove the defense buff from Gloom Floors. Fight these guys over most anything else. Zenki, I believe I only ever fought twice total in any of my runs. They double auto, which hurts. Otherwise, the frontal cone cast it does is easy to dodge while you kite. Kurokishi are about the same as Zenki. Double attacks, basic AoEs to avoid, keep kiting and avoid the cast, and you should be super safe with these. For the highlights of the finale, Floor 91, I do not like. I went into this run 100% intending to nuke the floor in some way. Opening of this as intended was raising, affluence to get more chests next floor, Fortune to maybe get an extra silver this floor, and intuition to find any hordes along the way. So I immediately prepare to use a Magicite the moment I get into any trouble. A Gozu is passing by, put my shield up for if it sees me and I don't get one shot. Oh and look, there's three of them. I sneak through as best as I can to find a few golds. I end up nearly getting Gozu'd and I make it all the way to the dead end before hitting the Magicite. Oh, and then I also alteration to try and make the next floor easy to speed through. I want to use all my alterations as long as I have purities and think I can beat mimics. Though 91 plus, mimics are super scary. This chest in the hallway back to the horde, I double take. Do I take it? Yes. It was a huge risk and it paid off. I skipped the other gold chest because I expected a mimic. I pushed my luck, but I felt I pushed as far as I was able. Floor 92, I alteration again. I sadly got Gloom too. I came into this floor set with 5 nukes, 2 Petrifies and 3 Magicite, which means I need to fight through at least 4 floors of enemies. I decide to make this one of them since I might have gotten Mandragoras. Because of Gloom, I pop a Strength and a Frailty just to cut a path. 
White mages are scary, even without gloom. But luckily, I also got that steel from last floor. I would have used a steel here too, if I didn't have it up already. Do not take gloom for granted. But also, don't serenity away if that's all it is. You only have three, and you need to make those count. Minimize exploring while our frailty is up since the timer is so low. Three minutes only, so you need to cut a path fast. I sadly got mimics and aggroed one, so I just used a witching to pass by. I skipped the golds I find after out of fear of mimic spawns. I do have decent luck line of sighting a bunch of the white mage cast though, making it a lot safer to finish off. I am worried about the gozu coming back as I continue, but I get to do a stealth exit. Floor 93, the difficulty goes down. Jackie, I feel, are less scary. They can instantly kill with Caribdis, but just line of sight and you're good. I am also forced to re-steal though, since I need to kill a white mage. Again, these guys scare me. And, oh good, another mimic room. See, I have awful luck. So I just stealth past them. I should have started fighting sooner to better make use of the rest of the frailty, but also I am peak fear during all of this. Luckily, I make it through the room of Jackie's just fine with steel and strength. Sadly, my kill count quota isn't good enough. This floor alone took a while. That's the main reason we want strength up, for the speeding up. Floor 94. I came into this floor set with a total of six trap counters, safety and sights. So from 94 on, pop one at least per floor, and every floor is covered. I also went into 94 with a flight active, and I pushed to go into 95 with it up too. Main issue is... All of my options suck. I can't line of sight anything. White Mage you LOS, Jackie you LOS, and Jinba you need to LOS. So I resolved to pop the alteration. Not sure why, a fortune, an affluence, and petrify the floor. It really is my only option I felt like. I kill off what I can and get out. Floor 95, no items. I have to Serenity or Magicite no matter what. So I resolved to Magicite the floor. I got a Serenity, but I wanted to see if I could find if there was a Mandragora room. Save it for next floor. Slowly hiding behind the patrolling knight, I do find this is a Mandragora room. So now I'm gonna fight my way out. I have options. Jinba are easy enough as long as you have line of sight. And then I jumped right into a trap I didn't notice was in the water. Luckily, it was a summoning, which meant I could petrify. I wanted to save my Magicite, so do that instead. Floor 96, oh boy, blindness! Pop a fortune and try to fight through is my initial idea. Go full offensive and just get through. Luckily, 96 is where the floors I would say get easier. Gozu are scary, and so are the Dullahans, but I've learned after the fact that the Pegasi are actually pretty okay to fight. But there's so many patrols on this floor, and one sees me. I opt to instead take a few risks and open some chests. I get two strengths for my trouble, and some exploding silvers. I was very sad about that. Floor 97, I have three serenities. I no longer care what negative effects I get per floor. I am just removing them instantly. There is no reason to hoard them anymore. Pop and go. Sadly, this is another wide open floor. And while it was super generous for the game to give me yet another strength, I have to fight hard to get out. More luckily though, is that with what resources I had, Kyozo are super free kills. Their dangerous mechanic is that they buff the defense for a time. Basic kiting and keeping my steel running for the rest of the duty? I did have three after all. Meant I was basically invincible. Just, uh, don't randomly use a palm and near them? I nearly got animation locked and died. I luckily was able to get a horde, but it was still a real bad call to use it when I did. But otherwise, that was this whole floor. Sneak through to the safe enemies, the horse knights need line of sight, and kill those in my little safe wall area. And I needed a lot of them. I needed eight kills to get out. Like what? Luckily I had strength or that would have been 10 minutes for the whole floor. I got into 98 with a concealment running. I'm not sure why? Honestly? It was a panic move I think. And it was a waste anyway because my first enemy is a mimic. 
which is a great, great start to what is going to be the final floor of the run. I am saving that Magicite for 99. I have no intent of fighting floor 99. So I scout for more patrols and start fighting. And then they appear after. I noticed there was a second, and then maybe a third? So maybe four patrols on this floor that will be popping in and out? Again, if I knew they were safe, I probably would have fought them. One guide said they should be avoided and had zero consistency on what was actually dangerous to me. I asked Angelus after my clear if it was okay, and he told me yeah. But I didn't know, and I was afraid. So I hid, and nearly got caught more than once. But after enough hiding, I made it to the silver I was banking on since the moment I saw it. And... It was a Magicite. Nuke 98. Leave. Don't. Explore. Serenity 99. Nuke 99. Leave. Floor 100. And here I am. Floor 100, solo. I spent that last bit basically hyperventilating. I could not breathe. I was completely safe. Nothing could touch me. And yet I was so afraid, so full of fear, the relief that washed over me when I got that achievement prompt. For the next few hours, I felt that. I felt this. It hurt. It was so scary, but I did it. And you can too. You can too. You need a bit of luck, a lot of training, and feeling things out, but you can become a lone hero. I just hope that this experience helped you through it yourself. I'm not an expert. People like Finn and Angelus are. Check their videos out for their expert viewpoints. I'm just like you. Someone who had little to no experience, who made a push. A push that worked out. You can be a lone hero. You can do it too. Join us. Thanks for watching my journey into madness. Follow me on Twitch, Twitter, give to my Patreon if you can, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to also check out the experts of Deep Dungeon and their points of views for even longer form guides on how to do these difficult things. Angelus especially helped me out with this one. Next up will be the even harder to clear Eureka Orthos. Hope you enjoy that, and may the power of Anadid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And of course, the best place to support me is over on Patreon, so special thanks to all my patrons, with extra special thanks going out to Amen Al Khatib, Benjamin Han, Benjamin Rice, Ethan W., Fraser97, Henny G., James Hall, Jeremy Abbott, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Mizella, Shimmering Blaze, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. See ya for Eureka Orthos.